Muhammad Yunus, born in 1940. When the early Muslim traders and merchants first arrived in the coastal regions of India in the 7th century, they were welcomed with open arms by the locals. Though these pioneering Muslims came primarily to conduct business, over time they married and settled in some of the most remote coastal towns and villages of India, Ceylon, Sumatra and the Maldives. When Ibn Battuta, the celebrated 14th century Muslim globetrotter, visited those areas, he was surprised to find thriving indigenous Muslim communities in all the major coastal regions of India, Ceylon and Sumatra. One of the most prominent seaports of the subcontinent at the time was Chittagong in present-day Bangladesh, where Muslim traders came regularly from as far and away as Yemen to conduct trade and business. This city not only became a commercial hub for the early Muslim traders, it also became a prominent centre of Islamic spirituality, Sufism. As the home of one of Bangladesh's larger seaports, Chittagong, has remained a thriving centre of trade and commerce to this day. Muhammad Yunus, one of the most radical economists of contemporary times and arguably the single most influential banker of the 20th century, hailed from this age-old centre of commerce and spirituality. Born and brought up in a lower middle-class Muslim family, young Yunus attended his local school where he studied Bengali language, literature, mathematics and aspects of science. He grew up during a politically volatile and culturally confusing time in the history of the subcontinent. The Second World War had started in 1939 and the British, who still maintained their grip on India, had joined the fight against the Nazis in Europe. As an integral part of British India, East Bengal also faced an imminent military invasion from the Japanese who were at the time making rapid progress in the East. And to make matters worse, the people of East Bengal were at the same time passing through a period of considerable social-cultural conflict and confusion. What did it actually mean to be a Bengali Muslim? Should the people of India remain loyal to the crown during a difficult period in British history or should they rebel? What would happen to the Indian Muslims if the British decided to quit? Could the Hindus and Muslims live side by side in a free and independent India? Yunus spent his early childhood in the hearts of Chittagong's commercial district at the time when people of India and especially its large Muslim minority were asking themselves such politically pertinent and culturally relevant questions. As it transpired, the British had no choice but to quit India in 1947 after agreeing to Muhammad Ali Jinnah's demand for a separate homeland for the Muslims in India. Yunus was only seven at the time. The Muslims of East Bengal, which later became known as East Pakistan, were obviously delighted with the outcome, although Yunus was too young to understand and appreciate the significance of this historic event. As a talented student, he excelled in his studies and completed his further education at Chittagong's College before proceeding to Dhaka University for higher studies. After graduating from Dhaka University in 1961, he lectured on economics at Chittagong's College until 1965 when he won a Fulbright scholarship to read economics in the United States. He left his native East Pakistan and moved to the United States to pursue research in economics at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. In 1972, he returned to a new country now named Bangladesh with a doctorate in economics. As a Bengali nationalist, Yunus was happy to see Bangladesh appear on the world map. And as an economist, he was keen to help his new country reorganise its crumbling economic infrastructure. But, according to Yunus, the country's leaders were not very keen to utilise his skills. On a personal level, his relationship with his Russian wife, who bore him a daughter, had deteriorated until she finally left him and returned to the United States. Following a brief stint at the Planning Commission, he became a professor and head of department of economics at the University of Chittagong in 1972. 
while he was busy teaching economics. Eunice observed to his utter dismay the harrowing impact of abject poverty on those who lived in the villages adjacent to the university campus. He couldn't understand why the locals did not make better use of their agricultural land, which remained uncultivated season after season. The villagers failed to make better use of fertile, uncultivatable land and did not make economic sense to Eunice. Although he was not an agriculturalist, he was very keen to find out why the locals did not grow crops, fruits and vegetables which they could consume and also sell in the local markets. And from 1972 to 1976, he explored different ways in which he could improve the economic conditions of the local villages. As a result, he established a small farming and irrigation project to improve the use of the local agricultural land. While working on these projects, he discovered that the wealthier farmers tended to dominate their poorer counterparts. Moreover, making the local villagers completely dependent on their land did not seem to him to be a good idea either, especially given the fact that he had yet to identify the underlying causes of their economic backwardness. Although the main purpose of these projects was to help the poor to become self-reliant and independent, Eunice's failure to address the root cause of poverty made him rethink his research methodology and objectives. During his study and research, he also drawing on his practical experience of devising and delivering small agricultural projects. Eunice came up with the idea of lending small amounts of money to the very poor in order to encourage them to set up small businesses. The borrower was required to repay the sum plus a nominal amount of interest over a period of time out of the profits generated from the business. Pioneered by Eunice in 1967, this method of lending small sums of money to some of the world's poorest people became known as the system of microcredit. Since the conventional financial system refused to give loans to people who had no fixed assets, he felt the poor and the destitute could never obtain loans from the bank because they had no valuables or collateral. So the question of where the poor could go to obtain small loans needed to be resolved. In his attempts to obtain bank loans for the poor, Eunice discovered that conventional banks operated on the principle which automatically excluded the very poor from receiving any form of credit. And this prompted him to set up the Grameen village bank experiment in 1977 in order to provide credit to the poor, especially to the women in rural areas of Bangladesh. By giving out such loans, he hoped to encourage women to set up small-scale businesses and self-help ventures, and in so doing enable them to stand on their own two feet and gradually improve their socio-economic condition. In theory, the concept of microcredit seemed to be a commendable one, but it was not clear whether it would not actually work in practice. In Eunice's own word, at first I didn't know if it was right. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just learnt as I went along, learning empirically from experience. Our work became a struggle to show that the financial untouchables are actually touchable, even huggable. And to my amazement and surprise, the repayment of the loan by people who borrow without collateral is much better than those whose borrowing are secured by enormous assets. Indeed, more than 98% of our loans are repaid because the poor know this is the only opportunity they have to break out of poverty. When in 1979 he was granted a two-year break from teaching at Chittagong University, he replicated the Grameen Bank Scheme in a deprived part of Tangail, which is located on the outskirts of Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh. When the experiment proves a success, Yunus and his colleague deployed the microcredit self-help program in other areas of Tangail. From then on, the Grameen Bank gradually expanded across rural Bangladesh, so that today it provides help to millions of poor and needy people across Bangladesh through his microcredit self-help scheme. But one of them may ask, what is so unique and special about the Grameen Bank? First and foremost, the Grameen Bank is nothing like a conventional bank. Indeed, it has no resemblance whatsoever to a conventional bank. 
A conventional bank's basic operating principle is the more you have, the more you get. And conversely, if you don't have it, you don't get it. In other words, the conventional banks have designated the poor and needy people to be not credit worthy. That is to say, we can't touch you. Therefore, unwittingly or wittingly, the conventional banks have created a kind of financial apartheid, argues Eunice in his inspirational biography, Banker to the Poor. However, the Grameen Bank has turned this basic banking principle on its head because it does not operate on the premise of collateral. That means the very poor and needy who have no land and who have no assets of their own can obtain microcredit loans from the Grameen Bank to set up small businesses or self-help initiatives in order to improve their socio-economic condition and to boost their morale and their competence and their self-esteem. The system of microcredit pioneered by Eunice back in the 1970s has not only proved to be a great success in rural Bangladesh, the concept has since been successfully replicated in more than 60 countries around the world including the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, France, Australia, Malaysia, China, Norway and Finland. In addition to this, the system of microcredit has been hailed by some of the world's most powerful leaders and global financial institutions, including the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, as an important tool in the fight against abject poverty and deprivation. Though Eunice studied conventional economics in a conventional way, his understanding of economics is surprisingly unconventional. Rather, it is very radical. In his acceptance speech for the World Food Prize awarded to him in 1994, he stated, Brilliant theories of economics do not take into account issues of poverty and hunger. They tend to imply that these problems will be solved when the march of economic prosperity will sweep through the nation. Economists spent all their talents detailing the process of development and prosperity, but none on the process of poverty and hunger. I feel very strongly that if the world recognises poverty alleviation as an important and serious agenda, then we can create a world that we can be proud of, rather than feel ashamed of it, as we do right now. Eunice's radical approach to economics in general and poverty alleviation in particular, was initially dismissed as being simplistic and unworkable by his critics at the World Bank and other global financial institutions. But by turning the Grameen Bank into a successful venture, he proved all his detractors wrong. A quick browse through the Grameen Bank's balance sheet show how far it has come since its inception. In July 2005, total loans disbursed in by the Grameen Bank topped Five billion. The bank crossed the first billion dollar mark in March 1995, about 18 years after it was first inaugurated in 1976, by lending $27 to 42 people. And since then, the Grameen Bank has expanded so rapidly that today it dispersed more rural loans each year than any other Bangladeshi bank put together. It has also established thousands of branches across rural Bangladesh, serving around 5 million borrowers on their doorsteps in more than 40,000 villages. And with a workforce of more than 20,000, the bank collects millions of dollars in weekly repayment instalments. By all accounts, this is a truly great achievement. As a self-help programme, the Grameen Bank seeks to improve the socio-economic condition of the poor and needy people of Bangladesh. But as a system of microcredit, it seeks to tackle poverty and deprivation across the world. According to Eunice, poverty is an example of a cancer in which humans have created and foisted upon their fellow humans. It is so widespread because political oppression, economic inequality and social injustice are rife in many parts of the world. Moreover, the way international trade and businesses is conducted plays a major role in the proliferation of poverty and deprivation in the third world. For this reason, Eunice's pioneering effort 
to tackle abject poverty through microcredit schemes deserves more support and recognition from both politicians and the world's leading financial institutions than it has received so far. However, one of the reasons why Yunus's microcredit scheme has not been popular and successful in the Muslim world as it ought to be is because it is an interest usury based scheme since interest based transactions have been outlawed by the Holy Quran. Many Muslims have understandably refused to support such a scheme. I mean, I'm injecting something here, which is stupid. That's not um, a usury based system, but nevertheless. Nevertheless, poverty, both relative and absolute, can only be eradicated when the world's most powerful leaders and financial institutions make poverty eradication their first priority. And this will not happen until the world's prominent leaders are prepared to tackle the root cause of global inequality and injustice by addressing the imbalances and disparities which clearly exist in international trade between the wealthy Western nations and the poor third world nations. In other words, according to Eunice, poverty will not be completely eradicated until the restrictive practices which sustain the structures of global economic inequality and injustice are first dismantled. Thus, he is realistic enough to acknowledge that microcredit alone cannot, and will not, be able to tackle the cancer of global poverty and deprivation. But he is hopeful that it will encourage the world leaders and global financial institutions to make poverty alleviation their main priority. Nevertheless, it would not be an exaggeration to say that by pioneering the concept of microcredit, Eunice has made a significant contribution to the global fight against absolute poverty and deprivation. In recognition of his outstanding achievement, he has been awarded scores of prestigious international prizes and awards, including the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. Muhammad Yunus lives in Dhaka, Bangladesh, with his wife and daughter.